Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, all. Um, welcome to our distance ed online learning workshop on communication. Um, your DE gurus are here this morning. Um, I'm Lori Allen Requa. I teach in biology. Um, we have Judy Wong and Nora Mitchell, if you two want to um, introduce yourselves really quick. Uh, I'm Judy Wong. I'm a DE Corp coordinator with Lori and Nora and I teach ESOL. And I'm Nora Mitchell and I'm the poker coordinator, coordinator peer online course review, part of the DE team and happy to be here. And I also teach ESOL. So for this Monday morning, I was thinking about it this morning. It's kind of a funny topic first thing Monday morning because we're probably all still a little asleep, but we're gonna talk communication. And um, what we are going to do this morning is talk about um, kind of first <clears throat> how you communicate in your classes. And this, you know, we're kind of focusing on online classes, but this is, you know, these communication tools you can use for hybrid classes, you can use for your face to face classes. So we'll talk about um, the different types of communication you use. Um, the second thing we'll talk about is setting expectations for communication in your classes and how you use it, but then kind of following through with um, those expectations. Um, and then talking about the legal regulations, number three there is the two ways your students should be interacting, um, and that's based on Title V regulations, so this is state law. Um, and kind of comparing that to how your students interact now. And then um, I've always said it, already said it, but number four, follow through on your expectations and how you actually communicate when the class is actually happening. So um, to get us rolling this morning and wake us up a little bit, um, think about how you communicate currently in your class. Do you tweet? Uh, do you post in some other online platform? Um, what is your favorite communication tool? And do you use it in your class? Do you use Facebook Messenger in your class? Um, do you use Slack in your class? Um, and do you think it is effective? So if you'll put in the chat um, it, what your favorite communication tool is. Um, so two separate things, your favorite communication tool and if you use it in class, and if that's a no, then think about the communication tool you use in class, write that down and say if that's effective. Um, so go ahead and put that in the chat and we'll get everybody's brains warmed up um, on Monday morning, but I won't make you talk if you don't want to because it is Monday morning, at least not yet, not yet. Oh, well, maybe everybody's really asleep at their, <laughs> they don't even want to put it in the chat. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Just takes time to type. Yeah. I know. I need to. I'm going to drink some tea. This is what I do in my class when I'm waiting for students to respond as I drink my tea. And let me just say good morning again, y'all. I'm glad you joined us on this Monday morning. Okay, so what's happening? Oh, WeChat. Yeah, I know that. You know what that is, Emily, and I feel like I should because I sit right next to you in the office. You teach you so well, you'll hear it a lot. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. In class announcements. Hi, Irina. Okay, a combination of making announcements in the Zoom classes, cool, which you record, and Canvas announcements, nice. Canvas email. Hi, Meryl. I like that too. And chat too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, chat. Hi, Donald. Canvas Hi. message, nice. E Ping in class announcements. Nora uses email, Canvas announcements primarily. Oh, setting notifications. So Nora rocks at this. I'm so bad at reminding my students to set their notifications. Good morning, Jack. Email is what Jack uses. 
Oh, and record class to send to students. Annie does announcements in Canvas, individual emails. Oh, yeah, good point, Annie, if they use their emails. Um, mm -hmm. We all have that problem. Right. Okay, um, so this is actually great. You all have a wide variety of things um, and some new things that I hadn't heard of either. Um, so that's awesome. So the kind of bottom line question here, is it effective? And that's kind of what this um, presentation is about is making the communications effective. So we do have some um, state laws that we have to follow above and beyond what our contract is. And this is Title V and Title V has specific language on communication. And I've put the section there we put the section there so that um, you can look up the details um, if you want the actual legal verbiage, um, because I'm not a lawyer. Um, 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 and Donald, I just saw your question come up. How do we define what is good? And I think it's that last question that we're trying to answer is the effectiveness of it. Um, I think that kind of helps define whether it's good or not. So Title V says any portion of a course conducted through distance education includes regular and substantive interaction between the instructor, oh, sorry for that typo, the instructor and the students. Um, and then the key thing here is among the students as described in the core. So that's something that you need to check out of what is in your core. If you have student interaction in that, then you have to have it in your online classes. So, um, getting to what substantive is and this kind of gets on that question of what the heck is effective um, so it's engaging students in teaching learning and assessment consistent with the course content and then it includes at least two of the following so this is the list from title five so providing direct instruction assessing or providing feedback on a student's coursework providing information or responding to questions about the content of a course or competency facilitating a group discussion or providing interaction on a predictable and scheduled basis. So those are kind of the things that are outlined in Title V that we should be doing in the class. And um, notice that two of the things are kind of what is required by the law. So this is just kind of a rough list, um, but essentially we need to be doing two things of these to be meeting the law. Um, Nora, Judy, did I forget anything on this? Okay. So setting expectations. So one of the ways that we can be effective is at the beginning of the semester set expectations. And that's like the question there, how and when do you do it currently? So if you think about how you set, set expectations in your class, do you set them at the beginning of the class and then do you follow through? So one of the biggest things about online that um, faculty like to kind of get uppity about is initiating contact with students prior to course starting. Um, and since Donald's here, I'm just going to say, I know Donald, the contract says that, you know, we don't have to start working before a certain date, whatever that professional development date is. But this goes to the what is it, what does effective mean? If we really want to be an effective instructor, really initiating um, contact with students in our online classes, hybrid classes, even prior to the course start date is an effective way to make sure that they're in class on time and they know where they're going. Um, provide an explanation for students on when and how communication will happen and let students know how to reach you and expected response times. So these are kind of setting expectations um kind of in the beginning of class um was there something in the chat oh I'll, yeah. I'll type i'll answer chat if you want so okay you that would be great or or yeah. kind of if, if i should answer it yeah there is a good question from meryl she says so we need to send out communication often before an online class yeah so that's so in kind of the breast kind of the best practices in online teaching. One of the things that, that um, really helps students is setting out communication before the class starts. So they know, you know, what the expectations are for communication, 
when just a reminder of when classes start, especially like I just started a late start class. And so it's in the middle of the semester and students are already in the middle of stuff. So that really helps remind them that you know, classes are starting next week. So make sure you log into Canvas and log into the class. Yeah, um, I wanted to mention, I see Irina has that. It's like you can send it out a week before, but people might register a day before. So you, you have to send out the same thing a couple of times. Yeah, that's right. And then also, you know, ideally putting it in the, putting that copy of that um, letter in your orientation module and sending it out as an announcement. So then they know what, you know, the students who join later can see what you sent to everybody else before the class. Um, and then an important thing in those communications is to let students know how to reach you and those expected response times. So do they reach you through your Peralta email? Do you have a Google email that you prefer they use or do you use the Canvas inbox? Um, and then also if you have regular Zoom meetings or your office hours, um, those are really good things to put in that, that communication as well to really set the expectations. Um, so right now, if we're talking about interaction, once you've got the, the communication and the expectations set up, how do your students currently interact in your class? And if, if you'll just put it in the chat, I know some of you already said discussions, but if there's other ways, or just, you know, if that's the primary way, how do students interact in your classes? Judy, do you mind reading what's popping up? Oh, right, right. Oh, okay. So um, I, I think somebody hasn't typed yet. They're still, I'm still reading the ones from the last question, which is Donald said he starts sending out um, communications the Friday or Saturday before, before class starts. Oh, here they come. Discussion in small groups, um, peer reviews, hmm. and then discussion forums mostly, discussions. OK, yeah, those are awesome. So again, remember that if this is in your core, students need to be interacting in your class as required by Title V. So these ways of interaction, there's two general ways. And um, Judy and Nora, remind me, is this Title V or is this UDL? I think it's both. Is it both? Yeah, because they use the um, substantive, right? They used to use it, the substantive interaction. And that's part, this is included in that definition. Right? Okay. And I always think of things in terms of the, the CBC rubric. So oh, yeah. this one um, definitely satisfies requirements for alignment with the state's requirements for a quality reviewed course. Okay, so, so these two ways that Judy and Nora and I are talking about are structured and unstructured. So all the examples that you gave us were structured. So creating regular and meaningful opportunities for students to interact with each other about course content. So you said discussions, um, you said peer review. I think you also said small group projects or I said it in my head and thought I heard it out loud, um, but then also collaborative annotation. These are just examples. Um, the image on the right side of your screen, this is an example from one of my classes. Um, I teach biology classes, so this is an endocrine investigation discussion where students um, get to choose what hormone or gland or whatever. Um, but then notice that there are requirements for replying to their classmates in this discussion. So they have to do some research and then they have to reply to questions. And actually in this one, they have to go back and update their original post based on those um, discussions. So this is what would be considered structured um, interaction with the students. Are there questions on this? I feel like I need to slow down for questions. I'm, I'm no, I'll just add that it's a two things I, I'm always looking for when I'm reviewing courses is that is there quality and quantity. So the, what Lori's got here, she's got the quality. So what the student should be writing about, what her expectations are for the content. And then quantity is give them a, an idea of how much they should write. And if you're doing both those things, then you're giving plenty of guidance. 
Yeah, so to follow up on what Nora says, so I have six things they have to do in their discussion, but like what she was saying, there's no like word count, there's no, you know, um, sentence number. Um, and then in the reply, so I give them specific numbers here. So three classmates and the replies need to be four sentences long. So you can see the difference between those two, what I should have done in the top one I did for the discussions. I see a hand, oh, Emily. Um, just for clarification, um, the rule is two general ways, but then one assignment here, like this discussion is targeting like four general ways. Would that account for checking off the box? Like we can do this assignment multiple times in a semester. Um, would that be okay? It would be okay to check off the legal box um, for sure. One of the... <laughs> One of the things about what Nora was talking about in the state CBC rubric is that there should also be variety in assignment. So while this would definitely check off like Title V boxes, if you do this over and over and over again, that's not a lot of variety, right? So one of the things that um, the state in the quality badge would look for was also doing a little bit more variety of assignments. Am I in interpreting that correctly, Nora? Yeah, but it's not, they, it's a little loosely defined. So, you know, if you, if you rely heavily on discussion assignments for this type of interaction, I don't, I, you know, I don't think you're going to get dinged too much. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I yes. think there's kind of like best, pra you know, the best practices, and then there's like the minimum to skate by. Uh, so probably if you're just using discussions pretty heavily for this type of interaction, it's probably going to be fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So then the second one, um, oh, I have another example of structured. So creating regular meaningful opportunities again. So this is where um, we just did the workshop last week on Canvas Studio. Oop, oop, sorry, sorry. Sometimes me and my mouse get a little crazy. Um, so this is where um, there's a video posted in, um, a lecture video posted and the students are required to make comments on it. And then I can reply those comments. So this is another structured way in which um, students can interact. They can also interact with each other here. I just happen to have my interactions. And if you wanna see that bigger, that's um, what's going on here. Um, so this is just another example. Judy or Nora, do you have any comments on this? Good. Good. Okay. Um, Another way to do structured student to student interaction is through assignments. Um, so in this one, um, I think this is yours, Judy. Yeah, that's right, right. So this is an example of collaborative annotation. And I think some of you are actually using it in your courses. So I teach grammar and um, this assignment is we, I upload a um, text to Hypothesis, which is a social annotation tool. And then students um, will interact with that text by identifying the structure of the grammar and then um, commenting according to the directions that I give. So here, here I'm introducing the assignment. And then in the next slide, um, you'll see that how it looks, there's the text, and then on the right side, there's the interaction between the students um, surrounding this text. So this is, yeah, about collaborative. So they highlight something in the text and then you'll see on the right side um, what they commented on. And then sometimes I jump in at certain points, um, but where the names are blue are crossed out, that's where uh, students uh, commented with each other. And then you can see they even address each other. Hi, John, you know, this is, I think this is a conditional clause and so on like that. So this is another example of structured uh, communication because it's an assignment and I'm telling 
the students what they need to do surrounding um, this assignment. Any questions on this one? I think Annie, you use this too, right? You use, do you use a hypothesis? Um, <clears throat> I have tried, I, I really keep trying. Oh, okay. Um, I, I got it set up and uh, a hitch I got into was that when the students log on to it, then they have to do some kind of verification process and everybody got very confused with that. Oh. I, I didn't know what that was and they didn't know what, I, I, I have to straighten that out. And my intention is to use hypothesis, but I'm okay. surprised at how, how, how glitchy it is to get it going. Okay, and Meryl just commented and said she uses it too. And then she said that she didn't find there was a verification process. So maybe um, that's been cleared up and she said she could help you. I okay. could help you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? I was so confused at first, Judy, because I was like, immune system. I don't remember doing this. Oh, right, right, right. Kind of like the topic is <laughs> something, yeah. Right. I tried to pick articles. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. So the second general way for interaction is unstructured. The examples we just gave were very structured. There was points associated with them. There are very clear instructions about how the students were are um, asked to interact either with us or with each other. So this unstructured structured this is totally voluntary and informal it's kind of like chatting in the hall before class and that's exactly what the state is trying to get us to replicate in the online classroom right since you know everybody's on a computer someplace outside of um, the college building there's no physical space where students are just like sitting in class waiting for the teacher to get organized and chit chatting about you know the movie they saw or what have you so that's what this unstructured is. Um, and we've just got titles of four examples here, like a student lounge, um, student buddies that are voluntary, a class blog or wiki, um, a Padlet for non-course related postings. Um, and so, uh, Nora, I think this is yours. No. Oh, I think it was, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't put mine in, but I have a student, um, I use a student lounge sometimes in some of my classes students use it and other times they kind of don't use it but at least um you know i could i could just add a slide super quick and um dump a screenshot so there's a, yes. sorry hang on no that's okay that's a that's a good question so um meryl asked what is a student lounge and a student lounge is a pinned discussion i mean is that how you do it nora so i've got a slide sorry 11 Mm -hmm. Lori. Uh oh, I put it in the wrong spot. I'm sorry. Oh my god. That's okay. What what slide are you on? I made slide. I just made slide eleven. I guess I went the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nora, fail. Okay, a student lounge is a discussion assignment, but it's completely optional, not graded, and um okay fine i'll share my screen how's that sorry lori that was a big no, no 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 i got it oh okay oh sorry okay let me do i'll just do this so student lounge welcome to the virtual student union you can use this space to chat with classmates about anything you want form study groups share ideas post resources share career opportunities it's bit business english so careers um i've got discussion guidelines to remind them about but I also direct them, if you have course specific questions, post them to the course Q&A, because this is a very informal place, ungraded and optional. So that, those are kind of the important parts of a student lounge. I, I've, seen, um, I I've seen some great use of Padlet as just places to post. I love Padlet. I use that a lot. And that's another way to do both structured and unstructured communication, student to student. And it's kind of fun, a little more creative. And, and students do get kind of tired of the same discussion type assignment to, and the format of, of that in Canvas. So I think those are my, my two favorites is um, the discussion. I do use discussions a lot. And, uh, and then I use Padlet to kind of break it up a little bit. 
Yeah, so I see um, the interesting hard questions in the chat. So Meryl, do they get credit? No, the whole point that this is unstructured, that the there's infrequent contact with the instructor here, or it's it's all like, like for example, my 10 week class, it was when the Oscars were happening and I posted my favorite Oscar attire. Um, I happen to like Lenny Kravitz. I just would die to meet Lenny Kravitz. So like, that's what I posted. And then students have since taken over to Donald's question, is it effective? Um, and also to roll in Annie's that she used to set them up, but nobody ever uses them. And sometimes it's effective, but oftentimes it's more to Annie's point, students don't use them. Um, but um, Nora has made this point in other, um, other workshops where if you post something first, it kind of sets the tone and I just never did. Um, and so I was in kind of Annie's boat where students never used them. And so then, no, Donald, I don't think it was effective. But since I posted this thing about the Oscars, you know, it's only a 10 week class. We're in week five. Um, so students are have posted things about shows they're watching. Um, there was some um, event in Oakland, um, some roller skating event. Um, so, you know, in the past four weeks, there's been six posts. Is it effective? Students are communicating. That's all they have to be doing. Um, yeah, I think what you just said is exactly right. It depends on the group. And yeah, it really helps when I post first and then you know, we get, well, I'll post about something initially and then it will, maybe a student will run with it and it will, it will steer into another direction. Like mine, instead of the Oscars, mine was about music and, and why somebody was talking about why 80s music was so great. <laughs> and then they started posting different songs on that. And so I thought that was, it was great that they, you know, kept, kept, kept it going. And one more tool I'll mention that I think is, some instructors love is flip used to be flipgrid and some i've used it a little and i found i kind of similar to, to annie get you know trying out hypothesis i tried out flip and it was just like it was my students were too lost and i just decided to do the videos in canvas discussion to just use the canvas tool cool tool but you're, you just gauge your students and kind of their level of comfort with technology i've used flip as a student in classes and it's super fun um flip grid changed its name to flip and uh as far as how to find it come to our office hours and we'll help you out <laughs> yeah if there's i don't have a short answer yeah i i it's not exactly straightforward anymore. Um, oh, Lori, there was, a, I think Donald asked, how do we set this up? Like, is, so Nora, is this a pin, do you pin this um, lounge to your discussions at the top of your discussion? Yeah, I have a module at the very top called Hangout and Reach Out. So Hangout is Student Lounge and Reach Out is Course Q&A. And I've got both those um, discussion assignments sitting there. So it's always, they're always available. Okay, so then um, once we set the expectations, following through on them is always the hardest part because we get going in the semester and things just happen. So it's always important to make sure to continue to contact students throughout the semester by doing several things. Um, you already have all mentioned that, or some of you have already mentioned that you use announcements. Um, again, using them as you set the expectations. So if you have weekly or every other week, um, using the Canvas inbox weekly or every other week. Um, reply to student messages when you say you will. So was it 24 hours, Monday through Friday and 72 hours on the weekend or um, we know one faculty who seems to be able to reply to messages within an hour of students sending them. Um, I don't think that's an expectation we should all meet, but this faculty, that's their, that's their superpower, so um, that's great. 
Um, are you replying to students in the discussion? Did you set that up at the beginning of the semester that, you know, maybe you won't reply to every student in every discussion, but you'll reply to everybody um, in the whole semester? Um, do you give feedback on assignments and quizzes? Do you leave comments in the gradebook in the little comments section? Or do you use global announcements for feedback on assignments with the top three problems and successes? And this is something that I really like that I haven't used yet. Um, but if you see consistent issues with student work and you're leaving the same comment to students in the gradebook, then a global announcement for feedback is brilliant. And then you're telling everybody the same thing um, because it's a common problem. Also remind students regularly to visit your office hours. Um, this is a really good way to make sure that they know when your office hours are. Um, I put it on my homepage. I change my homepage weekly. And so my office hours are posted on that homepage. Also encourage students to use the inbox to ask questions if that's how you um, roll. I think the big take home message here is though is that um, you just follow through and actually leave feedback in all the places where you told students to look for it. You certainly do not need to do all of these things, but whatever you set up with students at the beginning of the semester, make sure you're doing that consistently. And everybody's got their, their thing that they like, and that's really important that you find it because then you'll be able to follow through. We don't want you to be doing things that are going to make you crazy. Life's crazy enough. So thank you. Are there any questions, comments, concerns about any of this? Any um, details that folks want? Um, uh -oh. Anything you want us to go back over? I, I was just going to add one thing to what you just said about the feedback. So you can also vary your feedback in um, different ways, not just always written comments, right? You can leave audio or um, video comments. So that kind of changes it up a lot and then establishes, you know, the communication aspect in um, different ways. Yeah, I, I use audio feedback a lot, but I also teach pronunciation. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> but even in other courses, it's, it's, it's just kind of a nice change for me as an instructor and the students, I think really get something out of hearing your voice. There's this, this humanizing side. Um, yeah, I love that. Yeah, so this is the cool thing about the grade book. You can leave written comments, but you can also leave audio or video comments directly through the grade book, which I think is what both Judy and Nora are, are referring to. So it's, it's makes it easy. Like you're already in the grade book. So you've got three ways that you could leave those comments. Other questions? Um, just about the grade book, I found that um, the ESL well, students, at least, they need, <clears throat> a lot of them have no idea how to check the grade book or how to find that information. And you have to teach them that. They have to include that in the course. All right, they often say, what comments? <laughs> and then you have to direct them oh, to how. Well, have, it's, it's the right, the, the print is small. Yeah, like, it is yeah. Print. yeah, and then they see it, uh, right, it's that tiny little chat box. Right, but, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I see um, Jack has a comment about publishing modules early for student review. I think that's, that's a, a great way also to um, follow through on the expectations so students can see what's coming and what, what um, to do. Um, I actually make in my kind of entry level classes, I actually make it assign an assignment that students have to go and all they have to do is copy and paste what the comment is. But that way I know that they found the comment and I give them five points for it. I mean, it's not much, but then, you know, when it really matters, I know that, you know, if they're not looking, then they're just, that's, I mean, this is a little flippant, but that's on them. Like, I know that they complete the assignment and I know they know where to look, but. One one thing, uh, I'll new topic. Sorry. Um, one thing I'll add is that I I tend to publish the homepage only of my course in advance of the semester starting. So that way, students who are new to online learning or college or whatever, 
and they're kind of like trying to figure everything out, they can at least know that, okay, there it is. And then I put a note at the bottom saying, you know, modules will open on this date. And then when that day comes, I put the big, huge start here button. So it's clear for students who are new what to click on to then get to the modules and work their way through in order. Uh, so I think that's another nice kind of before communication aspect. It's nice, but not necessary, but nice to have a little welcome video, very short, three minutes or something, a minute and a half, just welcoming them. If they do need to buy books, they can get a jump on that um, or let them know they don't need to. So they can just like not stress about that at least and look forward to your, your course opening up. Yeah, if you do a video too, you could actually say, you know, you know, I will have office hours once a week. I will leave comments on your assignments once a week. You can then be explicit about how you're going to communicate with them. So they also get it in that video. Judy, I cut you off. Were you going to say oh, that? Oh, that's okay. I was just going to mention that in our last, we just had another um, DE workshop last week on Canvas Studio. And so if you have any videos in your class of your, any points you're teaching or um, content that you're presenting, you can also, you know, put in the, the instructions when they're watching the video that they can communicate with each other through the comments section of those videos or um, make annotations while they're watching the video. So that's another way to build student to student interaction and instructor to student interaction too. And you can see the recording of that. Um, I think Lori has um, that ready. So if you want that, yep. we can provide that. Yeah, I'll send out a college-wide email and I'll post it on the DE website. I just figure have to figure out how to do a video post on that. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. I, yeah, I don't see that very often. Okay. Well, that's all we have for you all. Let me share our contact information one more time. Um, oh, almost. Wait, do I have a slide on this? We have, oh shoot, maybe I didn't put it in. Um, so we have one more Canvas, uh, we have one more workshop coming up. Um, it's not till May, but May is gonna be here. Oh, 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 oh. oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> All the other. Um, ah, I can't touch the mouse. Um, yeah, there it is, there it is. Yeah. May 4th, we'll be on using Canvas for in-person and hybrid. Um, the recordings, I'll send out a global email, um, but we also have a um, self-paced accessibility course um, that you can take, you can get paid for it. Um, I'm going to get the dates wrong so Judy or Nora could tell us. <laughs> oh yeah, so by April 28th, if you could enroll, that would be great so we can get your stipend processed in time, and then you need to complete it. Oh, did we change that as of Friday's meeting? Okay. No, that's not an email this morning. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Because <laughs> I thought we just... let me look it up. Yeah. All right. So um, it's supposed to be completed by June second. Yeah. Yeah. Because I thought we changed it after that meeting. But yeah. Anyway. So that's up there, and then there's a self enroll link, and you can um, enter the course through there, and we'll see you there. And then um, I think some of you have already taken it, right? I think Annie's taken it already, so um, you don't need to worry about it. <laughs> uh, that's that. All right, thanks you all. I'm gonna stop recording now if anybody. Mm -hmm.